Thank you for joining us at the Evolution of Medicine Summit. A warm welcome. We wanted to make a specific thank you to our sponsors that have made this event possible. Energetics, an innovative natural remedy and supplement company, is committed to revitalizing medicine. And Cyrex Labs, a clinical immunology laboratory specializing in functional immunology and autoimmunity. Most of all, thank you for listening. If you'd like to share this with your colleagues and friends on Facebook, if you enjoy the content, and if you have questions, you can ask us on Twitter with the hashtag EvoMed. Finally, if you really want to play your part in accelerating the evolution of medicine, ask your doctor if the Evolution of Medicine Summit might be right for them. Thank you and enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Evolution of Medicine World Summit. We are here today with a very special guest. I have Dr. Ronald Hoffman in the house. Dr. Hoffman is a veteran uh, researcher and physician, has been uh, in practice in New York for over 25 years, has been on the radio for 25 years, so I'm sure that this is a uh, medium that you're going to be very comfortable in, Dr. Hoffman. Indeed. So uh, today we're talking about the evolution of gastroenterology. Now, um, some people, particularly any gastroenterologists that are listening, might be a little bit surprised to know that you're not actually a gastroenterologist. Why do you feel like, in terms of the evolution of medicine, that it's relevant for a non-gastroenterologist to be speaking on this topic? Well, I think the, the analogy might be, uh, is it appropriate for... Uh, a member of one particular political party to speak on the political scene in America. I think that if you are a gastroenterologist, you may have a little bit of tunnel vision about the potential for gastroenterology to influence all systems of the body, and also a little bit of a tendency to be invested in some of the, the tried and true therapies of that field, such as prescribing lots of acid-blocking medication, for example. Okay, and so would you... Would you say that your perspective on the gut is more in terms of its influence on the other systems? I mean, how do you feel that if I say the evolution of gastroenterology, what do you what do you see looking forward from what you've seen in your twenty five years? Well, well, I'm I'm the consummate generalist. I, you know, I'm trained in internal medicine. I do medical nutrition, but I see the gut as being very central to just virtually everything that's going on in the body. A lot of what happens in the brain, a lot of what happens uh, in uh, the joints, uh, in the skin, uh, has its origin in the gut. So we, we can't really compartmentalize. Unfortunately, uh, in medicine, we see the gastroenterologist, then we see the dermatologist, then we may see the neurologist. And uh, it's, it's that kind of fragmentation that, that sometimes leads to problems. And so if we look at the major things that are going on with the gut, I mean, it seems like digestive diseases are probably the, the, the core focus of the gastroenterologist. What do you see as sort of the, the causes of those diseases? If, we, if we're looking at evolution, you know, we really want to look at, the, you know, at these causes. What do you see as the causes of the majority of these digestive and gastrointestinal diseases? Well, the gut that we have is not designed for the environment that we live in from a variety of standpoints. Uh, it's a gut that was designed for certain types of foods. Uh, the vast majority of us uh, don't consume anymore. Uh, it's also a gut that is designed for microbes uh, that we do our best to eradicate. You know, literally from uh, cradle to grave, uh, we're fighting against microbes. And, and that's good because in some ways we, we would succumb to many infectious diseases. But the trade-off is that uh, we've dramatically altered the composition of the gut, and we're coming to recognize the key word, microbiome. The microbiome is so influential in so many aspects of our health. So if you were a gastroenterologist in school, let's say 10, 20 years ago, what would you have missed? If You obviously probably wouldn't be learning that much about microbes at that point. This is a new science, is that right? Well, it, it's new, but it's also uh, very old because... Uh, I believe it was in the early 1900s that uh, Eli Mechnikov won a Nobel Prize uh, for talking about uh, the microbiome. He was a big proponent of uh, natural cultures, of uh, yogurts to replenish the GI tract. Uh, and that concept got a little bit lost because we, we kind of got enamored of high-tech medicine and of the new powerful drugs uh, that were at our disposal and uh, lost our way a little bit, I think, in our, in our global understanding of what's right for the body. 
has the gastrointestinal tract become even sort of simplified and, and split up itself? It seems like you have specialists for the top of the tract and the bottom of the tract, but it's really one pipe, right? Well, absolutely. And uh, problems uh, higher up affect lower down. And uh, also there's an intimate relationship between the GI tract and uh, tissue that's very close. Uh, the uh, GU tract, the urinary tract, uh, the uh, sexual organs, uh, particularly in women. Uh, there's also a relationship uh, with the mouth, the throat, uh, and uh, ENT doctors. It's getting so that ENT doctors, when patients come in and say, I'm hoarse, you know, I have a little you know, congestion uh, or uh, tightness in the throat, they'll say, take an acid-blocking medication because that's gastro reflux. So they, they recognize that there's a close interplay. So can you maybe just give an example from your, your time as a clinician where you've had, a, you've had an issue that's come up in a completely disparate part of the body from the gut and worked on the gut and then there's been a full resolvement of that case without need for medication or ongoing medication? I have a very interesting case of a woman who came in with a bizarre neurological condition. Uh, she literally came staggering into my office. And she was uh, actually a very, very celebrated uh, yoga teacher uh, here in New York uh, with, a, with a fantastic clientele. And so she, she developed this debilitating uh, neurological disease that caused her to stagger. And she was initially diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, but she was rather young for that in her early 50s. And then they said, well, it seems like you have Parkinson's disease, but this is atypical Parkinson's disease. Long story short, they began treating her for Parkinson's disease with very little benefit. What does that look like, treating for Parkinson's? Because from listening to someone like David Perlmutter, the treatment for Parkinson's disease is really just like anti-medication to stop the symptoms. Stop the shakes, yes. Yeah. You know, various types of medications that, that may slow the progression uh, or relieve symptoms, but ultimately don't change the course of the disease. So uh, we evaluated her and... One of the things that I look for, and, and you know, I look to Dr. Perlmutter as uh, an important mentor, is gluten sensitivity. And in fact, she didn't just have minor gluten sensitivity. She had full-blown celiac disease. And upon elimination of the gluten, uh, her symptoms got about 50% better. Now, you may say, well, your proposition was you've seen total resolution uh, with uh, some sort of crucial GI intervention. And the problem is once you've had a neurological condition that has uh, developed over a course of perhaps decades, it's very hard to reverse some of the damage that's been done. Literally, uh, your nervous system may have been poisoned uh, by some of the immune factors that are generated by celiac disease that, that traverse the gut wall and go into the systemic circulation and then ultimately hit the brain and the nerves. So you basically can do damage. Once you do damage to the brains and the nerves, it's very difficult to sort of rehabilitate that. Some of it is irrevocable, okay. but however, remarkable improvement. And she was very grateful for the insight that, uh, you know, every day she was literally uh, poisoning her nervous system. So that's one way of interacting with the brain. I know you're also quite big. I've been following your intelligent medicine podcasts and so forth. You've been very interested in, in psychobiotics, which is sort of affecting the the, the function of mental health or the brain through interventions in the gut. That, to me, just screams the evolution of medicine because there's no way that a neurologist is thinking about the gut or that uh, these types of specialists are communicating. But it, it seems obvious that given that the body is almost a perfect example of holism, of different systems working together, it seems that the evolution of medicine will will have a big focus on now these disparate specialties working together and thinking together. If you have a toxic gut, that toxicity may manifest early as a general sense of malaise or even what might be described as depression. And so it may be true that altering your GI microbe composition uh, may make you happy or at least alleviate something that's pulling downward on your mood. That's so interesting. And so beyond the brain... Uh, you mentioned skin earlier. Uh, I was just actually speaking with a, a doctor recently whose husband is a dermatologist and the tough cases that he gets, he sends to her and then they clean up the diet and things you know, sort of mysteriously disappear. The skin seems to be another big axis with the gut. How is that interaction happening biologically? Yeah, the most classic example of that is in celiac disease, which we recognize as a gastro problem where there's inflammation of the gut. 
characteristically due to gluten. Uh, one of the cardinal manifestations of that, a key sign, is a condition called dermatitis herpetiformis. Now, if you are familiar with uh, Latin or Greek, I don't even know which where the root comes from, but herpes, herpetiformis, in other words, it has a little bit the form of herpes on your skin. Okay. Uh, there's little sort of uh, uh, herpes-like um, bubbles that can appear on your skin due to gluten consumption and the, the theory is that uh, various types of immunological factors get generated because of the clash between uh, the gluten and your own immune system. They circulate through your bloodstream, they're deposited in the skin, and lo and behold, you've got skin problems. Mm -hmm. So th look, that's a dramatic example, uh, a classic example, one that's recognized by medicine. But there's so many other examples. For example, acne okay. uh, or eczema. Uh, too often, the gut uh, skin connection is ignored, or the uh, food allergy skin connection is ignored. Uh, food allergies uh, can uh, affect the gut. Uh, foods that are improperly digested pass through what is called a leaky gut. This is a very important concept now in medicine is that the permeability of the gut, normally it keeps bad things out like microbes and allergens, but it absorbs good things. So you want actually the proper balance between good absorption and keeping the bad things out. We have a leaky gut. It's almost like there's this onrush of toxic elements and allergenic elements into your systemic circulation. And then the possibilities are endless for various types of symptomatic problems. It could, you know, head to toe, organ system to organ system, you could have problems. I think that is the most important thing that we will discuss at all of this is that if we're only looking at medicine from terms of symptoms, how would we know whether these disparate versions of symptoms are all coming as a result of this one cause, which is just this break in the mucosal lining, this break in the gut lining, and yet the symptoms could be anywhere. If we're only waiting for symptoms to occur and then dealing with those symptoms, we're never going to get, you know, backtrack there. It seems like starting with the gut is, is really the only starting point when you're getting these chronic symptoms coming up. Is that is that typical of your strategy in practice to start working on the gut as sort of a, a primary measure? Oh, very much so. Uh, so we will check patients for leaky gut. There are tests that can tell us whether that's present. Uh, we'll also look for uh, food intolerances that can uh, trigger inflammation in the gut. Uh, we may check the status of the bacteria in the gut to see if there's a normal balance, if there are good bacteria or conversely, if there are harmful bacteria there, or if there's, and this goes back to the 1980s, we recognized a condition called candida, or the yeast connection, uh, which I think uh, was sort of a, a uh, foresight about how things would develop now in the 21st century. This is, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, people were talking about candida or yeast problem. Uh, I think a more sophisticated way to look at it is that yeast and other harmful microorganisms create a toxic brew in your intestinal tract, creating various forms of problems. Would you say that the, the future of gastroenterology, it seems like you need to be more like an ecologist rather than a, um, a specific gastroenterologist. It's really an ecology down there. It's an it's a ongoing development uh, life habitat. Well, yeah, it, it kind of goes to the way that we do agriculture or the way that we do uh, warfare in America. If you think back to the Vietnam era, the strategy uh, to defeat the North Vietnamese was to defoliate the country. Yeah. And in so doing, uh, we destroyed the country. We created a lot of uh, ecological devastation. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't win the war and uh, it left a terrible legacy. Uh, similarly, we you know, take the strategy, uh, find a bug, use a drug. We try to eradicate harmful bacteria. Uh, if uh, there's gastrointestinal symptoms uh, that we attribute to acid, we block the acidity. But to your point, we really need to pay attention to the integrity of the ecology or the ecosystem that keeps us healthy. Because if we take care of one aspect of it, but we damage the ecosystem, then the health goes downhill. And unfortunately, you know, I, I see a lot of talk about this and I see a lot of uh, research, but there's such a lag time in the adoption of these strategies by most doctors. Most doctors are very harried. They have to treat symptoms. They have to give patients immediate relief. And also many patients don't want to make lifestyle changes. So unfortunately, we're not seeing this type of medicine uh, become uh, mainstream. It, it's certainly a lot of people demand it, look for it. My patients do. Yeah. But uh, the, the, 
the major medical paradigm in America, I'm concerned, is, is moving in the wrong direction. Well, our hope with this summit and the other things that we have going on, Dr. Hoffman, is that you know, more and more people will understand that this is really a rational framework for dealing with a chronic set of symptoms. And so uh, you know, I, I definitely applaud your uh, leadership in this and, and sort of being ahead of the curve. But I hope that the adoption is improving. But what I do see is that is that more and more people are starting to realize that they can actually uh, affect their own health uh, with their lifestyle choices, which is encouraging. So if we just go back to sort of the biochemistry and the physiology, what, what is an ideal environment uh, for, uh, for optimal health? On, if we go from sort of mouth to colon, what would be an ideal environment that means that the gut is doing what it's meant to be doing, which is obviously like digestion, immunity, metabolism, What's, what's happening through that and how can we, uh, what would you see as an ideal environment? Well, one suggestion that I've made, a little bit tongue in cheek, was be born in a major. <laughs> okay. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, the son of God. Uh, it means that uh, you're born in an environment where you're exposed to certain pathogens and, and literally you're exposed to barnyard animals as humans were uh, over centuries and millennia of evolution uh, because uh, we interact helpfully with many of these microbes. You know, the, the, uh, the human immune system, it's a little bit like, you know, when you get a, a computer, a new computer, or when you get a new uh, iPad, um, it's got a lot of potentiality. But if it had every single program that you could possibly have already on it, yeah. uh, you would, you know, it would be the size of you know, a, an 18 wheeler. Yeah. So that's why you, it's got a lot of potentiality. That's like the human immune system. Cause otherwise we'd have to be born with, you know, a, a huge amount of extra tissue yeah. uh, to program resistance. So what we do is we, we develop resistance to what's in our local environment. Okay. And so if you're born in Mexico city, it's one thing. If you're born in New York city, it's another, if you're born in Mumbai, it's another. Yeah. And so that this eliminates redundancy. But in order to program your immune system, you have to be exposed to certain things. Also, you have to not instantaneously eradicate every infection that a child has. The tendency now to reach for the antibiotics at first instigation. Pediatricians are getting better about this. But yeah. still, parents demand it. It's a lot of anxiety. Kids get a lot, of, a lot more meds than they need. We destroy their helpful bacteria. So a solid... Uh sort of a deep combination of microbes all the way down through the gut is important. Um, how about the permeability of the, of the gut itself? Like what stuff should be getting through and what stuff shouldn't? Well, one big mistake, here's another big mistake that we make. If you want to screw up your intestinal permeability, uh, take a lot of painkillers, particularly aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like Advil uh, and Motrin. Okay. Uh, because those drugs... Uh, are known to cause ulcers, okay. but even if they don't cause an ulcer, they may cause little microscopic fissures in your gastrointestinal tract, literally giving you leaky gut. Now, I actually recently saw a kid uh, who's a very promising young college football player who's developed ulcerative colitis, and you know, I took the history, and then I said, well, what are some of the things that happened right before? Well, he was taking a lot of antibiotics because he'd had some sinus infections. And, oh, by the way, he plays football. He's had some injuries. So virtually every day uh, during practice, he would pop a few Advils because the coach said, hey, you know, you want to you want to get loose? You want to feel okay uh, when you're hitting that tackling dummy? You know, go ahead and take some Advil. So literally he created a leaky gut situation. I mean, look, I'm not saying that we can always go back in time and trace the origin of the yeah. disease. But that's the perfect storm. Uh, for developing problems, add a little stress. You know, freshman year away from home, playing in a you know big college football team, and you've got a perfect storm that could create uh, ulcerative colitis. You know, that's such a, an important story for me hearing that because one of my best friends from from school, I think, it's, same exact thing, rugby. You, I knew you were going to say rugby because you being from you know yeah. From, from, so he played rugby. He's a great player and. You know, I think there's a few things that maybe contributed to it, but he was certainly in a rugby position where you're getting hurt all yep. the time. And I would say that he basically had exactly the same thing as this guy, except instead of walking into Dr. Hoffman's office, he's walking into a regular N NHS hospital. Yep. And two days later, is having three feet of his colon removed. Yes. Indeed. If that guy had walked into another uh, 
hospital, is that the plan that most people would have done with us ulcerative colitis? Is that the plan? Well, that's the that's the end stage. I mean, it, you wage war strategically against ulcerative colitis, starting with you know mild medications, and then steroids, okay. and then powerful immune suppressive drugs, and as a very last resort, they say, well, the colon, you know, you can survive without it. We'll just remove it, and things will be fine. I mean, the problem is, is that I see a lot of people after they've had their colon removed, and their problems are not over. Yeah. So it's not like that's it's like you're just starting new problems. I mean, what what is the net long term effect of not having that part of your colon? I mean, in terms of absorbability of nutrients and so forth, it seems like there's obviously a reason why that's there. Clearly, just taking it out. It's clearly, you know, it's like if thine colon offend thee, pluck it out. You know, <laughs> but it what happens is, and there is another condition that I think uh, really needs recognition. It's called SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So there's the small intestine, first thing, you know, there's the esophagus, the stomach, then the small intestine, which is really not so small, it's about 10 or 12 feet, and then there's the large intestine, which in colitis is affected and can be removed, so they say, without consequences. But the small intestine should not have any bacteria. And when bacteria migrate from your large intestine, where they belong, into your small intestine, then you start getting symptoms. You get gas, bloating, cramps, and... Uh, this is a condition that afflicts uh, tens of millions of Americans. We make it worse with acid-blocking medication. I can't tell you how much damage these medications do. And so many doctors, uh, when patients ask, well, how long do I need to be on this? And the doctor says, mm, after the rest of your life, it's fine, no problem. Well, there are a lot of problems associated with disrupting your digestion uh, via destruction, total destruction of your acid environment. So there's that many people using it. Could you just explain for everyone out there what is the perceived or intention of the mechanism that's being used when they take an acid blocker and what does it do? Like why do, why do millions of people trust it? And then what are the long-term consequences that are happening from doing that? Well, if, if I you know, were to grab your hand and say, here, I've got some, some uh, potent hydrochloric acid here and I'm going to drop this on your palm, uh, you know, after a few drips and drabs of that, uh, your palm might start to sizzle. <laughs> so the notion is that simply, you know, if you have gastrointestinal uh, burning, pain, irritation, or even an ulcer, that by uh, eliminating the acid, uh, you know, there's a sort of a neutral environment there and uh, there won't be any additional damage and the healing will occur. Uh, that is the case occasionally, and I do, I do prescribe these medications. Uh, the problem with this is these medications are the ideal drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, because once you're on them, uh, you get hooked. And I'm not talking about you get high hooked, but you become dependent on them, because once you remove these medications, your acid doesn't just go back to normal, it surges to unprecedented levels. And so a lot of people going off them, trying to go off them, uh, they have terrible distress, and they say, well, I guess I really need to be on this medication. They don't really need to be on the medication. It's just that they've had acid rebound. And so this is a very, very insidious problem. Acid rebound, is that a, is that a technical term or yeah, is that it, your, one of yours? No, no, indeed, it is a term because uh, you suppress uh, your acid and correspondingly your body says, well, gee, there's no acid. We've got to make some acid. We've got to make some acid. When you take away the medication, it's almost like you've let go of a rubber band and snap you know, you're going to get a reaction and a hyperacidity situation, which convinces you or your doctor that you really need to be on these medications for life. Yeah. That's very worrying. And, you know, I see that across quite a few drug categories, actually. Um, I, I've seen Headache that. Headache medications, yeah. characteristically, many drugs. Panic, you said? Headache medications. Oh, headache. Okay. Well, certainly psychiatric medications, yeah. very much so, yeah. It's a great business model. Recently, there was a guy named Kevin Trudeau yeah. who was convicted of fraud, mm -hmm. and then because he didn't pay this huge settlement that he owed the government, they've now thrown him in, in prison. Okay. And, you know, his analysis of the situation, uh, which was repeated endlessly on infomercials and late-night TV, was that uh, drug companies are trying to deprive us of natural remedies intentionally so they can sell us more drugs. And I have to say that that may be the subtext or the unintended consequence of their business model. I don't really believe that the drug companies are out to deliberately undermine the health of Americans so that they can profit more. I, I don't, I'm not a conspiracy theorist along those lines. But the net effect is that using drugs mm. that people become dependent on is not ultimately in their interest. And 
uh, is a great business model because uh, the, the use of drugs is self-perpetuating. Yeah. And I, I don't think that it's, it's, it's something, some diabolical plan has yeah. been developed. Uh, I just believe that that's the consequence of how we've evolved. Look, it's a, it's a profit-oriented system. Yeah. And the media is very, very prey to the commercial influences of the pharmaceutical industry. Same thing with medical school. Yeah. Uh, we In medical school, our learning was basically uh, underwritten by the pharmaceutical industry. So really, doctors, when were you in medical school? In the 1980s. Okay. So, so it, it's even worse now. So it, doctors should be trained to be critical consumers of what's out there. And mm -hmm. they should say, well, look, okay, there's, here's the nutrition, here's the, the natural therapies, here's the pharmaceuticals. We'll utilize them as appropriate for our patients. But often the orientation is, here's the disease, here's how you treat it. Boom, boom, boom. This is the protocol. Follow the protocol. If you deviate from the protocol, it's bad practice, malpractice, not evidence based, uh, not evidence based, uh, and so on. Yeah. Or, uh, and then you get uh, ostracized from, uh, or even, uh, you know, sued or, or lose your license. I mean, okay. this is the way it is. I mean, what we what we actually see probably across all of these things is like short term gain versus medium to long term loss. I mean, that's really what we're Indeed. talking about with these kind of things, right? Because there, there obviously has to be a short term gain in order to become evidence based. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, even the system by which we base evidence is subject to a lot of uh, concerning features because uh, much of the research is drug company sponsored. Much of the research that shows uh, inefficacy of drugs is buried. You know, yep. studies that show that this drug doesn't work. Well, let's not publish that study. Yep. Let's deep six it. And sometimes the data is not even accessible to people who want to find out, well, what went wrong with that drug? Well, sorry, that's proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real mess. So we've started sort of at the top and we've looked at acid and, and stomach and so forth. If we go a bit further down the GI tract towards the large intestine, small, you mentioned SIBO. What are some of the other things that millions and millions of Americans and, and people in all industrial economies are dealing with further down the gut? Well, you go, go travel further down, you get irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, you get diverticulitis or diverticulosis. Mm -hmm. uh, Colin Burkett uh, illustrated very nicely in the 1960s, he was a British surgeon uh, who kind of got tired of slicing and dicing people and he kept saying, gee, maybe there's a way that we can avert all the surgery. You know, he got, you know, it's pretty routine to take out people's intestines. So he said, let's do some further research. He traveled down to Africa uh, and he discovered that the diseases that were uh, rampant in England uh, were virtually unknown mm. in Africa because, well, in those days, you know, uh, many decades ago, they had not yet uh, suffered the ravages of the westernized diet. More and more Africans are beginning to suffer from degenerative diseases. You know, they got McDonald's in Cape Town now. Well, big time, and, you know, and but also in, in the so-called developing countries, yeah. uh, the diets have really deteriorated. They're not uh, indigenous diets anymore. Yeah. And so, uh, so for example, if you were a med student in Rwanda, yeah, uh, you would be reading a textbook that probably was published in London, and you'd be reading about diseases like ulcerative colitis uh, and uh, colon cancer and diverticulitis, uh, but it would be uh, you would remark, gee, I've never really seen a case of that <laughs> if yeah. you were a doctor in Rwanda. Yeah. Uh, but uh, actually, Colin Birkin remarked that uh, when he was down there in one of these underdeveloped countries, the only person who ever suffered colon cancer that he ever encountered was himself a doctor. Okay. Uh, a, a doctor who was of, of that country who was affluent enough to consume a Western diet and develop colon cancer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the things I think is a huge, huge part, you know, my my sort of quasi medical education, if you'd call it that, has really become through understanding the body as a flow system. You know, that was uh, Heinz Henrik Reckerwig who talked about the body as a flow system. And if you just go back to all of it, it seems like the the real flow, the major flow, is this GI flow from mouth to colon. And um, you know, his his thoughts were that a lot of these stagnation diseases were just being caused by essentially a blockage in the main part of the flow, essentially constipation. And I see that, you know, it's funny as a as a Brit growing up because 
fart jokes and feces <laughs> jokes and whatever is, you know, the, the classic the British... Staple. I thought that was staple. a German thing. <laughs> well, uh, a lot of people find it funny, but the British particularly, but I think the British, it's, it's also, also this, like... Um, Sort of embarrassment and fear and shame and guilt and those kind of things and it seems to be all interwoven with uh, with GI stuff. How important is a is a good flow uh, at that end of you know bowel movements and what are the what are the causes that you see being uh, the symptoms as a reflection of that flow being uh, suboptimal? This goes back to uh, medical school and already in medical school I had an interest in natural medicine. I already knew that I wanted to be a, a nutritionally oriented. Uh, in those days, the word holistic physician. And so I, I had a tendency to, um, you know, I, I learned pretty quickly that one way to, the key to success in medical school was to learn the stuff and not necessarily to attend every lecture because every, not all lecturers were good and you could learn the stuff, pass your tests. But I saw a lecture on the schedule entitled Diarrhea and Constipation. And I thought, wow, that's actually something very tangible. That's something that I can really learn from. So yeah. I went to the lecture, I showed up. And the lecture began by uh, polling the audience, medical students. Uh, how many of you have three or four bowel movements per day? A few people raise their hands. How many of you have one bowel movement per day? A few people raise their hands. Uh, how many of you have a bowel movement every other day? A few people raise their hands. And how many of you have like two bowel movements per week? And people raise their hands. And he said, and I'll never forget this. He said, you are all normal. And I just shook my head vociferously, and I said, that's not right, yeah. because there is such a thing as optimal, optimal intestinal transit, because those who might be having two bowel movements per week uh, were courting the risk of intestinal toxicity. Uh, they had slowed down transit, and that's not good. That's a, and it may be a sign of a very low-fiber diet or a destroyed microbiome in their intestinal tract. Yeah. So you know, optimal elimination. I mean, this is a way that we uh, eliminate toxins from our body. It's a very, very important part of, of optimal health. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, people, it's funny you say the word toxins, because I think as holistic doctors or uh, and people in this, people say, oh, what are these toxins, these mystery toxins? But we're talking about metals and chemicals. Like, there, there's a lot of toxins out there. And I was at a lecture last year at the IHS on microbiome, and they were saying, that 90%, between 50, but more like 90% of all of the toxic metals that come out of our body come out through the feces. Like that's the way that the body does it. That's the microbes working in tandem. This seems like a hugely important way for toxicity to move out. And if you don't have that there, that's the first time that now toxicity is touching tissue, essentially, right? right. If it's not moving consistently. Right. I mean, it's, it's a clear, clearly an elimination pathway from the body, but it's also... Your gut is a, 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 it's like a chemical toxic factory, potentially. Yeah. I'll give you an example. A guy uh, was found to uh, be drunk, uncoordinated, and inebriated uh, periodically. And his wife was a nurse. And for some reason, he was staying at home, and his wife was going to work, and she would come home, and he'd act disoriented. And she said, you've been drinking again. And he said, no, I've given up drinking. I'm not drinking. He says, I can tell you've been drinking, and to prove it, I'm going to uh, give you uh, a um, the uh, breath test, the alcohol breath test, because yeah. she had a device that she you know borrowed from the hospital, brought okay. home, and he blew very very high, uh, you know DUI levels of alcohol from his breath, and she said, look, I, you know, it, there's no sense in hiding it from me. Where are the bottles? And he said, look, I'm not drinking, and so look, she said, we're going to go to the hospital, and I'm going to consult. Uh, with uh, an expert in the hospital, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. And um, so, you know, they told the story. The guy said, look, there's only one way to resolve this. We'll put this guy in a metabolic ward where he's absolutely locked down. He will have no access to alcohol, and then we'll test him. Yeah. And after three days, they tested him, and he was blowing phenomenal levels of alcohol. Yeah. And the conclusion was that it was from his gastrointestinal tract. He was literally auto-intoxicated. And this is written up in a major medical journal as a, as a short, uh, brief communication. So what was the treatment? They gave him antifungal medication because we know that if you want to make wine, beer, yeah. any kind of alcohol, you just need some yeast and some kind of fermentable carbohydrate. And boom, you've got alcohol, you know, uh, ethanol. Do you think that would stand up in a court of law uh, for <laughs> myself or anyone who I know in the future who happens to get hey, caught that, on a DUI? That, that's a good idea. I'll think about that.
you know, I, I, I have a couple of patients who are, uh, shall we say, law enforcement officials, and they, okay. give, they give me their cards that are sort of get-out-of-jail cards, and they say, <laughs> if you have any trouble when you're in uh, Long Island, give me a call, you know? <laughs> it's like... But yeah, I like the, that defense. So what that's essentially saying is that this ecology down there in the gut is capable of producing a lot of you know, chemicals. There's a lot right. of things that could happen. Not just that, but other, you know, a myriad of chemicals. Yeah. That's just one very obvious chemical that we can measure, but aldehydes and various uh, putrescent byproducts of abnormal digestion. Putrescent is a great word, yep. and it's quite onomatopoeic in the way of, uh, of sort of <laughs> understanding the, right. the, the, the a smell that may come. Is Would you say that... The, the, a smell of the bowels is sort of like a lead indicator of overall health? Well, you know, Tibetan medicine is largely based on smelling stuff and tasting stuff. Okay. Hopefully not tasting stool, but uh, <laughs> I had the opportunity to uh, shadow uh, an eminent uh, Tibetan doctor, the doctor to the Dalai Lama. His name was Yeshi Dandan uh, mm. many years ago. Wow. And uh, when he saw patients, uh, he would ask them to produce a urine sample, and he would smell it, and then he would, to my utter horror, taste it, you know, dip his finger in and put it on his tongue. And, uh, you know, the smell of the skin, you smell the patient, mm -hmm. open your mouth, just, you know, bad breath and all, you yeah. know, let me, you know, let me have it. And uh, this was one of the ways where he, in that system of medicine, very ancient system of medicine, they were able to come up with diagnoses. That's so interesting. But that's actually not too, now they're coming yeah. up with this new idea that they will have devices that will actually be able to smell diseases. You know, dogs can mm -hmm. smell cancer. Okay. Dogs can be trained to recognize certain cancers. They're saying, well, let's use an electronic device that has an ultra-sophisticated nose that can detect the smell of, say, diabetes or the smell of certain cancers. I mean, that is amazing. And that is amazing, particularly in the context of this evolution of medicine, where in some ways, you know, can you just talk from your experience a little bit here and GI focused or otherwise, you know, you said you'd be with Tibetan medicine and there's Chinese medicine. There's all of these other systems of medicine that sort of, it seems as though Western medicine sort of poo pooed and laughed at because it wasn't sophisticated, but it seems like pieces of this are sort of coming back into medicine. And one of the things I sort of think about is like, we have no idea how long these medical systems were around for. And it seems like, if one thing they had going for them was that they were sustainable. Yes. And so, you know, in the same way that an acid blocker might be good in the short term, but, you know, poor in the long and medium term, it seems like Western medicine, you know, if you take a step back, is good in the short term and maybe not so good in the short term and in the, in the long, longer term and medium term. And that's the reason why, hey, perhaps, you know, for the first time ever in America, certain segments of the population are not living as long. We thought we'd be living yep. till 150 or 200 20 years ago when we could map the genome and all this stuff, and it's just not happening. What do you think that medicine, as it evolves, can learn from these these other systems of medicine um, that we haven't, that we probably sort of maybe a bit arrogantly uh, looked at without too much respect? What can we learn from them? Well, an admission here, when I was in college, uh, I had absolutely no idea that I wanted to go to medical school. It, it was the farthest thing from my mind. I was studying cultural anthropology. Okay. And one of the tenets of cultural anthropology is that you go into the field uh, with an inquisitive and open mind, and you look at the practices of the individuals as absurd as they might seem to the Western eye, and you try to understand their functionality and their usefulness, or, or lack thereof, because not everything that people do makes sense. Uh, but from that perspective, I derived a great deal of respect uh, for ancient practices, alternative practices, uh, natural health systems that, that weren't science-based, but were empirically based, that kept people uh, sustained for the vast majority of our uh, existence as homo sapiens. You know, we look at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the scientific revolution has been going on for what, maybe 200 years. Yeah. Uh, in medicine, perhaps you know, uh, 150 years, and the practices that we use are are they're science based, but they're very novel, and we have a sort of a uh, um, a cultural or scientific hubris that makes us believe that somehow they are superior to ancient uh, or unscientific practices mm -hmm. that really deserve uh, more attention. Yeah, and integration. I think uh, I've heard 
already a number of people say, you know, so Andrew Weil always says, you've got to do Western medicine well, and you've got to do this medicine well, and just deliver good medicine. And it seems like that's sort of the evolution that we're, we're look, moving towards is taking the best of things and, and, and combining them together. So if we were to look at from that perspective of gastrointestinal, what do you see as sort of like the optimal gastro uh, gastrointestinal health or relationship with a doctor or strategies for the myriad of the types of diseases that we see today? I think there will always be a place for uh, gastroenterologists uh, who utilize high-tech methods to detect disease. They can scope people six ways to Sunday and find out where the problem is. Yeah. And uh, there is a need for medications for people who are super sick. Because as I say to some patients who are come in very sick with GI problems, uh, they want a natural cure. And I say, look, you know, if your house is on fire, you know, we're not going to uh, have you talk about fire prevention. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go in, you know, with uh, high pressure hoses and and axes, chop down the door, flood your home, but we're gonna put the fire out. Yeah, and that's so you can survive. Yeah, but so so there's a place for that. On the other hand, I think there is a, in gastroenterology in particular, but I think this is something that all integrative physicians can use, and and no question that uh, chiropractors, naturopaths. Uh, nutritionists are all very turned on to this, not just uh, holistic MDs and DOs. The importance of diet, the primacy of uh, sustaining the microbiome, uh, being a little bit of a, you know, what I sometimes, uh, I feel like I'm a little bit of a, uh, an arbiter between conventional medicine and the patient in the sense that the patient comes in and says, well, look, they say I need to take this. And I go, well, you know, if you just took, you know, this natural therapy, you might be fine. You don't really need it. Or in some cases, like, look, don't delude yourself. You really do need to take a medication. Yeah. So there's a, I think there's a place for uh, gatekeepers to protect people from the excesses of medicine to come up with, you know, lower tech or more natural approaches. Yeah, there's a couple of things I'd like to get into because I, I really would like to get into the microbiome stuff at some point. But I know that just on that, what you just spoken about, one of the books that I've read that you wrote is called How to Talk to Your Doctor. And I know... You know, although there's there's probably a lot of people on this on this line today who are listening who are thinking, you know, I know that I can change my diet and improve my health, but my doctor doesn't necessarily feel like that way, and they sort of maybe hide things from their doctor or they you know they they um, they do that. What would you say? What are some of the strategies, the basic strategies in that book by which people can have a more open and honest dialogue about the kind of things that we're speaking about today? Because I know that there are people that are addicted to acid blockers. I know there are people addicted, uh, addicted to laxatives. And, you know, these are not s sustainable strategies, but the doctor says you've got to be on them. And if you, you know, you've only got seven minutes to communicate to them, like how... How do we go about having a more open, honest, and mutually respectful relationship with our doctors to help the doctors move along this course as well? Well, I think you have to establish uh, some ground rules for how you're going to interact with your doctor. Uh, always be you know, respectful and always be you know, not uh, confrontational, but say, look, you're interested where possible in uh, natural approaches, in low-tech uh, approaches, in preventive approaches, and where necessary, you're willing to listen. Uh, but if your doctor, and then assess your doctor's reaction. If your doctor says, look, my way or the highway, that stuff is all bunk, it's garbage, it's fraud, uh, then you have to vote with your feet. You yeah. really do. Because you have to find at least a doctor. You, I don't expect all doctors that you'll encounter to say, hey, that's great. I'm all for um, these natural therapies. So that's a little bit too much to hope for. Some might, but the vast majority will say, what you're, what you're aiming for is a doctor will say, look, I don't know that much about these natural therapies, but if you bring me the information and you keep me apprised of what you're doing, I'll be happy to supervise your uh, use of these approaches. However, and the doctor will tell you this, if I think you're going down the wrong path, I will speak up and inform you. I mean, that's more of a, a balanced approach to this. That does sound balanced. And, and I, you bring up something that, that I, I think is so important is, is voting with your feet generally. And it's almost voting with your feet, but it's also voting with your dollars. You know, yep. people are frustrated by the, you know, the, the paradigm of what they see out there of the foods that are available in their certain areas. We're in New York. It's very lucky. You can get basically anything you want at any time of the day. But in most places, you know, I've, I used to live in Georgia and I know that it was, it was difficult to get the right kind of healthy food choices. You had to be very, you know, you had to be very proactive about it. So, 
this idea of voting with your feet and voting with your dollars, what do you think is the most empowering way to, uh, for patients to uh, start to change some of these habits? Well, you know, I think you have to look at uh, you know, diet, exercise patterns. I think it's important to uh, inform yourself from reliable sources. Some of the sources aren't uh, reliable. I think, you know, a good place is to start out with, uh, you know, information that comes from well-vetted sources. I would consider you uh, a good curator of information. Uh, you know, if, uh, if I'm guilty of self-promotion, forgive me, but the uh, uh, Intelligent Medicine podcasts are... I hope, a source of useful information. You can get them at drhoffman.com. And, and a lot of people, I think, uh, empower themselves. And this is sort of a grassroots movement to yeah. some extent. You know, a lot of the stuff that we do that's good for us is not government-sanctioned. It's not a, a sanctioned by corporate America. It's not sanctioned by establishment figures in our lives. Uh, but things that we do maybe locally in our community to help friends, families, uh, others who were less fortunate, uh, many of the, the best efforts are grassroots efforts that aren't necessarily coming from some uh, centralized bureaucracy with edicts. Well, one of the things that's encouraging in a certain way, and this is not, not the way that we'd all like it to happen, but so many people are starting to, one, get these symptoms that their doctor can't help, and two, make these changes by themselves, use the internet, get different information in, see improvement. It's, it's almost like we now have a sort of a fertile place for people to be able to, you know, to make these kind of changes. Because, you know, just think back 30 years ago, there's no way that all this information you could get it. Where are you going to go? The library? I mean, this is not, this is not. Remarkable changes. Yeah, have so occurred. easy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, drhoffman.com slash podcast is the intelligent medicine podcast there's a lot of great information on there i think those are some great starting points um just as far as let's just go through the through these different areas that we've spoken about and talk about some of the the natural ways that you've seen to be effective so let's start at the top like the the combination of gi and ear nose and throat things acid blockers the mm -hmm. stuff that's going on there what are the kind of things that you're using in the practice to to work with uh, those kind of issues well if you're on acid blockers uh and you're don't go off them very quickly. You need to taper slowly. Okay. So I think many people and sometimes doctors make the mistake of saying, okay, you can go off now. Okay. So taper slowly. Utilize um, products like DGL, which is deglycerinated licorice. It's, okay. You, it's important that the licorice be deglycerinated because uh, too much licorice will raise your blood pressure. But okay. what, you don't need that component to soothe the esophagus and the stomach. And you can take these little lozenges and chew on them all day long. You can have eight or ten or twelve a day yeah and it's very soothing you can use aloe vera gel not the juice aloe vera gel taken away from meals that's okay. very healing a product that i like to use and it's um it's unfortunately not available retail it's available through doctors it's called endefin e-n-d-e-f-e-n and it's a mixture of uh, plantain and uh, other mucilaginous uh, substances uh, that's very soothing to the esophagus it, we heal a lot of uh uh, GERD, reflux, and uh, gastritis symptoms with that product. And then probiotics, of course. Yeah. But, but the key is diet change. Yeah. And, you know, the, even people who run a, quote, healthy diet, you know, they're eating like uh, granola and skim milk and lots of fruits <laughs> and vegetables and juices, they may have a lot of gurgling and uh, reflux. They might find that they, they do better when they reduce their carbs and have uh, more in the way of animal protein, I find. Yeah, well, we're going to have a lot of discussion about diet, um, and I know that you have, you know, your own views on it, and other people think very differently, and you know that that's Huge part of this. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a controversial area, but I think, you know, the one thing that you would probably agree with is that people are different. People are going to work out different different ways, and they need to be in a relationship with a doctor or a functional medicine doctor or someone like that who can help them to go through and try out different things until they find something that's sustainable for them. Exactly. It, it's a lot of it is trial and error and uh, different strokes for different folks. Okay. So we've got about, we've got a, just about 10 minutes left here and I want to get into a little bit into this microbiome because sure. it's, it's so, uh, it's so valuable to think a little bit about this because Let's just give the example of, of in gut infections. So we're talking about GI diseases. 
the moment that I saw that fecal transplants were the cure, uh -huh. this amazing cure for uh, these chronic infections like C. difficile, which were antibiotic resistant, I knew that the sort of the game was up as far as like our regular understanding of the germ theory and, and how germs are sort of causing disease. Could you just give a, a quick overview of uh, for people at home about what what these new types of treatments are because it's really a it's really a super probiotic isn't it right. feces in the gut okay this caveat this is not yet ready for prime time it's okay. being done under very strict research protocols yeah and uh my general advice is don't try this at home <laughs> uh and it's the yuck factor is very high here but it, yeah but the point is that uh when people have very very disrupted uh microbiomes you know there's 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 uh, probably as many different types of uh, species of, of bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract as there are stars in the sky yeah so uh, taking one probiotic or taking even a combination of probably 8 10 12 different things it's still not going to replete you and restore you to normalcy yeah so that's the principle behind fecal transfer or transplant it's been helpful in very very serious diarrhea problems like C. difficile uh, some studies have been done in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and, and that's hopeful. Uh, the problem is, you know, how are you going to commercialize this? I, I really fear for the lack of impetus to get this um, on stream because all the money, all the uh, commercial emphasis, yeah. and our current paradigm is to find a very niched drug which can be patented yeah. and that will miraculously block this or that or the other pathway and change the immune system. And... Uh, so, how are you going to monetize uh, donating feces? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> well, the gift economy is certainly starting to rise. So, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll be generous with mine. I'm not sure if I'm, you know, exactly. The, I think we need to oh, find you, the healthiest you must have people. Great flora. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think your flora is probably. I've not good. had that much antibiotics. I think that's right. probably a, a good a good starting point. Yeah, you bring on to an interesting topic there, which is sort of this: um, what's cheap versus what works, and the future of medicine as far as the proliferation of things that don't make money. Mm -hmm. I know this is another topic that you, you speak about a lot, just sort of like the war on natural medicine and so forth. What are your sort of hopes and fears for the next five years in American medicine? What, what do you fear will happen and what do you sort of hope will happen? Well, you know, I, I see you know, real problems occurring and especially, I mean, uh, Obamacare, whichever political party you adhere to, uh, it just happens to be that the current administration is holding the ball on the demise of American medicine that's been occurring for a really long time. Yeah. And, you know, it's it, there's going to be a point of reckoning where it's going to undermine the health of Americans, destroy our productivity, and also just destroy our economy. The way we're uh, allocating money uh, with expensive solutions for problems that uh, might be more amenable to lower tech, uh, cheaper solutions and prevention. So, but what's going to happen, I think, you know, just like physical fitness, uh, the Americans are getting fatter. However, the physical fitness movement is burgeoning in America. More and more Americans are getting healthy. I think it's going to be maybe a, uh, an enlightened minority of Americans who opt for healthier, um, uh, styles of health management, yeah. uh, that will lead the charge that hopefully, I mean, I, I'm very uncertain about the way things are going to go. I think there may be a real crash and burn, uh, that's required. You know, it's like in uh, addiction theory, you know, you got to hit bottom before you can uh, begin your 12-step program. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's definitely the, the direction that we're that we're headed, unfortunately. Um, but if you, on the more hopeful side, what signs do you see that we're moving towards a more sustainable medicine, medical system that the evolution of medicine is occurring? Well, there's just an explosion in the number of practitioners offering this type of medicine who are well-trained, well-informed, uh, I see that coming from you know my field, medicine, MDs, but naturopaths are really a very important force in this country providing this type of information. They're well-trained, very scientifically based. Uh, chiropractors uh, have a lot of this information at their disposal. And uh, so there, there is uh, a phalanx of health practitioners, uh, nutritionists who are not just you know, pushing jello in hospitals yeah. and ensure and boost, but nutritionists who are, have a functional medicine understanding uh, are really making a difference. And you know, particularly here, we're talking New York, uh, uh, San Francisco, Denver, uh, Boston, uh, sort of points of light in, you know, kind of a, a dismal American uh, scene. 
Yeah. Well, it's definitely proliferating. And that's one of the reasons I started Revive Primary Care is I just felt, look, there are enough of these practitioners around. If you if you have the right person you know, to find these people, it's a great starting point. And, and having one of these practitioners, however they're credentialed, alongside your current medical yes. care seems to be synergistic. And, and other that's things the way that, to go. Yeah. That's the way to go. Other things that we're, we're trying to do in this summit is really start to talk about how you know how doctors can work with coaches how doctors can work with nutritionists how to get communication in medical structures because uh, I think that this is really what it's going to take for everyone to work together and I think what you've outlined today is is a, is a great vision for for the future of gastroenterology and if the future of gastroenterology looks like this I think the knock-on effects to the rest of the body uh, will be huge in the same way that a, a toxic gut uh, leads to all kinds of other symptoms a healthy gut or a revitalized gut will certainly lead to improvement in lots of other areas and uh, I see this coming all the way through so yeah uh, thanks so much for for your time and being here today Dr. Hoffman you can find uh, Dr. Hoffman's podcast is the Intelligent Medicine Podcast it's at drhoffman.com slash podcasts great guests all the time and uh, actually just uh, an unlimited or just a, a history of all of the podcasts that you've been doing for, for a long time with great people on there. And um, I look forward to uh, coming on again soon. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this has been the Evolution of Medicine Summit, a great session on the evolution of gastroenterology. And uh, I've had Dr. Ronald Hoffman here. Thanks so much again, Doc. My pleasure.